I, I probably shouldn't start this early. <laughs> but since it's our last night, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit. Yeah, okay, whoa. That's bright. Okay, very good. Give me a second for my eyes to adjust here. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful day it's been. Beautiful day. A beautiful Sabbath day. Amen. It's hard to believe we're coming to the end of this series. It's kind of a, a bittersweet thing. On one hand, my, uh, my voice is saying it's going to be... <laughs> I'm not going to have to preach as hard. But the other side is saying, Lord, your word must be preached. Amen. Well, let's turn to a friend, to a neighbor, welcome them here tonight, greet them, may everybody sense the joy of the Lord here tonight. Definitely want everybody to feel warm and welcome. We started our Unlocking Daniel seminar this morning with Pastor Steve. How many of you were there for that? Wasn't that a rich blessing? What a blessing to open the book of Daniel. We have special lessons that are going along with those. It's going to help you understand the prophecies more clearly than ever before. So if you haven't signed up for that class, definitely want to sign up for that. But as we begin tonight, we want to invite David Christensen to come. He's going to play a special song for us. We have the words on the screen. The song is called Sabbath Rest.
Our Father, tonight we thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. We thank you that we were able to leave our work. But sometimes it's so hard to leave our cares behind. But tonight we ask that you will be with us. Help us that we may grow closer to you for being here. Some of us have come with big burdens. Some of us have come with a lot of heartache. But may we find rest here. Now in a special way tonight I ask that you will be with our pastor. May he find rest from the, sharing with you the burden that is on his heart. And may souls be blessed for his having spoke here tonight and their having been here tonight. We ask this in thy blessed name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. What a blessing. What a blessing. Thank you for that prayer. Amen. Good evening. So good to see each of you here. Our final Unlocking Revelation meeting. Revelation's triumphant remnant. And just before we begin, I'd like to have one more prayer for God to give me the power of His Holy Spirit and for His Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us. Father, we just continue the prayer that has been prayed. For that Sabbath rest, yes, may the cares be set aside so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying to our hearts. Lord, more so tonight than ever before, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be present. May the things that we have studied, may the things that we have unlocked in Revelation, may they all work together to give us a grand, glorious picture of Jesus and of Him calling His people. Anoint my mouth, Lord, with that coal from on high. Speak through me, and may you be glorified. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation's triumphant remnant. I believe there is a, a hunger for genuine Christianity. As I preach this message, I know because I see those who have such a yearning for truth. They come, they see what Jesus says, and they make their decision to follow Him. There is an earnestness, a burden for the truth. People long for more than what they have. After the fall of communism, people line up for hours to get seats into a meeting like this. They long to hear the Word of God. Russian army trucks, they came. They were filled with Bibles. People crowded. They pushed close just so they could get their hands on the precious Word of God. They came into the meetings. They saw the words of prophecy open before them. They had been denied so long. And when the opportunity came, they were not going to miss it. There's a hunger to know and discover truth. I know there is because I see individual after individual want more than anything the truth of God's Word. And when they see it, it is that, that pearl of great price and they go, whatever it takes, they want to grab a hold of it. How I long to share God's Word with those who have ears to hear. There's nothing more disheartening and difficult than to point the way to Christ and people turn away. But when there's truth, here's the thing, the glit and glamour fades away. People don't desire a church that becomes a social club anymore. 
When they see the truth, they want it. They want, a, they want to satisfy the hunger that is only for Jesus Christ. They want to hear the Word of God preached. They want the Bible preached, not Newsweek preached. There's an inner compulsion for something solid, something that won't sink when we cling to it. And when we look down through the, the history of the Christian church, God has always had a people to proclaim His truth to the generation that was before them. Noah preached to a generation. He appealed for men and women to enter the ark of safety. The call was to step out from the majority to stop out, to step out from the, the masses. It's a call to take a step in faith, to get into the ark. A call to obey God and go to the ark of safety. In the days of Noah, the majority rejected God's call, but his faithful people, they did enter into that ark. God has a faithful people in every generation. In the Old Testament, God called Abraham out of that popular majority. Genesis 26, verse 2, it says, Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. God called him out to go where he was leading him. Not where culture would lead him. Not where people would lead him. But where God himself was guiding him. Notice the features of God's people. Genesis 26, verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's why he was God's chosen person. God chose Moses to lead his people. God called Moses to lead his people to keep his commandments. In the days of ancient Israel, God had people leading, calling for an obedient people who would follow the word of God. Deuteronomy 11 verse 1, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his what? His charge. His what? Statutes, his judgments, his commandments. Always. Not just for a, a little bit of time, but always. God is a chosen people. A people that love him, that keep his commandments. They're called his chosen people. Don't you want to be a part of God's chosen people? Oh, how God wants us to be His through and through and through. Amen? In the days of the New Testament, Peter preached powerfully. It says, Acts 2.41, Then those who gladly received his word, they were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 baptized on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter. God has a chosen people. When they hear the truth, they step out. They become God's people. They follow his commandments. Peter says, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God called them out of darkness into the light, from error into truth, from commandment breaking to commandment keeping. Throughout the centuries, God has had men and women who have been faithful to him. They've been called his church. Never God's intention for the Christian church to be fragmented and divided. Never was it God's intention for there to be thousands upon thousands of different denominations, each teaching something different. God's word teaches us something else, that Jesus wants his church to follow him. So as an eternal principle, we looked at this the other night. You don't go to the church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. How would you know which direction to go if you didn't have the Bible as the guide? You would be clueless where to go, which direction. Now, some people say, well, I've been born into this particular re religion. I've been born a Methodist from the day I was born, and I'm going to be a Methodist till the day that I die. Born, raised, stay, die. I've been a Catholic. I've been a Presbyterian. Here's the thing. What about the Jews? Isn't that what the Jews said when they crucified Jesus? They said, we've always been Jews. 
We can't accept any further light. That's what they said. And they crucified Jesus, who is the light of the world. So if we are so favored, if we are so blessed of God to receive further light than our parents had, more than our grandparents had, praise God. We should thank God that he is leading us closer and closer to Jesus. When you take a step to follow truth and become part of God's commandment keeping people, you do not deny any truth that you believed in the past. Now, while we may appreciate our past, we commit ourselves to following all of the truth that God has for us today. So if you were brought up a Methodist, praise God for the truth that you had at that time. God is calling you to walk further in his truth. We don't set aside our our past completely. We hold on to the truths. We step out of the errors and continue following to find more of God's truth. We thank him for it. So in taking the step, we're following Jesus. We're becoming a part of his special commandment, keeping people. We're not denying anything that was true in our past heritage. We're just leaving off the errors, right? Leaving off the errors that have been handed down to us. We're leaving off all of those falsehoods that are out of harmony with God's word. And we're stepping into the fullness of His truth. So you don't go to a church to find truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. And when you find the truth, then you look for a church that teaches the truth. You find a church that measures up to everything that is written in the Word of God. You may wonder, well, how does the Bible define the church? Well, here's the best definition of the Bible, I mean of the church in the Bible. 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul writing, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the, what? Church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. The church of the living God is the pillar and ground. It's the custodian of truth. We cannot share truth unless we have truth. Amen? Historian John Miller puts it this way in his book, The End of Religious Controversy, page 95. There is but one inquiry to be made, namely, which is the true church? By solving this one question, you will at once solve every question of a religious controversy that has ever been or that ever can be agitated. So solve this one question, which church is the true church? You want to know how to solve that? Well, you go find the truth in the Bible. You study your Bible, you compare the Bible with the church's teaching, and you can discover God's true church. If it measures up to the Bible, keep it. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Amen? Jesus prayed that his church would be one, John 17, 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. What is this unity based on? It's based on his word. In the same prayer, Jesus had said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's plan is for the Christian church, for his church to make the Bible its foundation and to simply follow as he has outlined in the sacred scriptures. Just give me a thus saith the Lord. Amen? Just give me the plain teaching of the Bible. What did Jesus say? John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus says that we can know the truth. But here's the question. Do we want the truth? Isn't that the real question? We become locked in our own opinions. We'll be unable to understand his truth. We say, this is the way I've always done it. I'm not changing my opinion. Are we going to find truth? No. We have to say, Lord, I want your will to be done. We lay all of our preconceived ideas aside. We come to the Lord and we say, give me what you are teaching in your word. I want what your word says. It's a prayer that says, Lord, show me your truth, even if it is different than I have believed in the past. 
He shows us his word. He gives us the truth of his word. If we have that desire to say, Lord, you give it to me and I'll walk in it. Show me the way and I'll walk in it. See, the Lord never wanted there to be division in his church. No schism, no division. He wants us to come seeking his way, seeking his truth. The Bible predicted that in the early days of Christianity, there would be a departure from the teachings of God's word. We've looked at this in depth. He says, Acts 20, verse 30, And also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Not to the word of God, but after themselves. The book of Revelation describes God's faithful people who would cling to the, to the truth at any cost. My question is, are we that kind of people here tonight? Are we going to cling to God's word at any cost? Revelation chapter 12 describes more clearly, clearly than any other place in the Bible the history of God's faithful people. It describes God's plan, how there's this great controversy between God and Satan and his vicious attacks and we're going to look at this in four different, we'll call them episodes. This is the woman of Revelation chapter 12. We're going to see without a shadow of a doubt that there are identifying characteristics of this special group called God's true church. We see this woman appears in heaven. She's the bride of Jesus Christ. Now remember what a woman represents in Bible prophecy? A church. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Jesus is looking for a pure bride. The Apostle Paul presents the church as Jesus' bride. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we go, episode one. Satan rebels against God in heaven. I'm showing you the big picture of the great controversy, how the devil is fighting against God's true remnant people. Of course, we know Satan's cast out. We saw that. Amen? Christ wins. Satan loses. Episode 2, centuries pass by. Revelation 12, verse 44 and 5. And the dragon stood before the woman who, gave, who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. So Satan now focuses his attention on destroying Jesus. All of his strength, all of his energy is focused to destroy Christ. He's angry. He stands before the woman to devour her child. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who is this? It's Jesus. So Satan tries to destroy Jesus as soon as he's born. Did that happen in Scripture? Absolutely. Herod passed a decree. He said all male children must be killed. But the Bible says, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. What happened? Well, Jesus was taken with Mary and Joseph to Egypt. They fled to Egypt. God preserved them there. Satan could not destroy Christ. Later on, in the wilderness years, Satan appears as an angel of light, and he tempts Jesus in the hopes of destroying him. And what did Jesus say? He said, Satan, get behind me. Worship God alone. Amen? On the cross, Satan tried to destroy Jesus, but our Lord triumphed. Yes, he went to the grave, but he wouldn't stay there. He was raised from the grave. And the Bible says, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. His mission on earth was complete and he ascends into the heavenly places. Satan tries to destroy Jesus. What happens? Again, Christ wins. Satan loses. God provided a way of safety. So what does Satan do? Episode 3, he turns his wrath on the followers of Christ. You know this story. Someone can't get you while well, they go after your children, right? 
He couldn't get Jesus. Well, he's going to go after Jesus' church. All but one of the disciples died a martyr, martyr's death. Satan attacked the church. Church and state unite in the days of Constantine and following. And for a while, the church enjoyed this, this season of favor. There was a, an unusual popularity for Christianity. But things changed. As church and state united, Satan attacked. Many of God's faithful true believers were fiercely persecuted. History of the Popes, volume 2, page 334. It says, great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. Satan attacks like a vicious wolf. Notice Revelation 12, verse 6, what would God do? The woman then fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. What happens when Satan tried to, where he attempted to destroy the church of God in the dark ages, the woman, the church, she fled where? Into the wilderness. God brought the church into hiding. He prepared a place for her. So church and state unite. It's the dark ages from the year 538 to 1798. The large popular church reigns. Christ's church goes underground. It's in the wilderness. It's in hiding. How long would this last? The Bible says, Revelation 12, 6, that they should feed her there 1,000 260 days. We've seen this before. Remember, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. We looked at this in detail. The church is in the wilderness for 1,260 years. There is the, the reigning of the apostasy of all the errors coming in for that time period, but God's church goes underground. Church and state have united. It began 538 and ended in 1798, 1260 years. The Roman church pontiffs, they had more power during much of this time than the kings of Europe themselves. But God's true church is in the wilderness. For that period of time, they're in hiding Faithful men and women of God clinging to the words of God in seclusion. Many of them in the rocks, in the caves. Faithful men and women in seclusion, copying the Bible, making sure that they could share God's word of truth. The reformers were persecuted for their faith. Even during this time, God had faithful men and women. It was a tough time, but God had people who said, I will walk out from the majority. I will stand upon the word of God. My conscience is held captive to the word of God. So episode three, Satan tries to destroy Christ's church. Well, Satan could not keep the word of God hidden. He could not keep the word of God cast down forever. Amen? Amen. The wilderness period ends 1798 with the capture of the Pope by Napoleon's general, Berthier. We saw this period. Sometime, though, this is where it gets fascinating. Sometime after 1798, God would raise up his end time people because the truths are being restored, and then the message goes out with clarity and with power to the whole world. So just like in the days of the patriarchs, the New Testament, the Dark Ages, God would have a special commandment keeping people who are faithful to him. The book of Revelation describes the identifying characteristics of God's last day people. Let's look at them. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Abraham kept God's commandments. Moses kept God's commandments. The Israelites kept God's commandments. The New Testament church kept God's commandments. And here we see God will have a people. Two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. Let's look at these ten commandments first. 
Exodus 23 through 17. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That God would have a people who love him so much that they worship him directly. They don't put their confidence in the images and the icons. They don't put their confidence in pagan practices. Even if it's pagan or religious, they're going to go to the Bible and God says, worship him directly. He said, I'll take the name of the Lord in vain. They respect the name of Jesus. The things that come out of their mouth are to be a blessing to others. Amen? They accept Jesus as Savior. They accept Jesus as Lord. They don't take the name of Jesus and live it in an ungodly way. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Here is the commandment keeping people described in the book of Revelation that keep the seventh day Sabbath. Here's a group of people who love Jesus so much that they, they keep their thoughts pure. They say, Jesus, I don't want to think impure thoughts. I want to follow your commandments. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm going to be kind to others. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to hate. I want to be a part of that new covenant people. That God says, Hebrews 10, 16, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. They trust and obey because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. They trust that God's way is the best and happiest way to live. They're not some super saints, but they're committed to Jesus Christ. And they believe that God has raised up a special people and they want to be a part of it. So here are these two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God. They have the testimony of Jesus. The Bible defines the testimony of Jesus. We spent this morning's sermon on this topic. The Bible talks about the gift of prophecy in God's last day church. The testimony of Jesus, according to Revelation 19.10, is the spirit of prophecy. We saw how the church would come short in no gift, according to 1 Corinthians 1.7. They're going to be waiting for Jesus. They're going to have all of the gifts. The gift of the Holy Spirit would be manifested in the church, including one of those gifts would be including the spirit of prophecy. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world. The Holy Spirit would be poured out. There, there would be thousands that would take their stand with Christ in the last days. The true church would be a worldwide body committed to Christ and obedient to his word. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of how many nations? All the nations. This message would go out, and we're going to see this in Revelation 14. And it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And of course, Jesus' promise, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In every age, God will have a people who respond to his grace. They become a part of his church, a part of a special movement. Revelation, catch this point. Revelation describes a special last day movement. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Just as Jesus gave the command, right? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is not some little non-denominational movement. Not at all. This is a worldwide, a global movement that is preaching the gospel to every nation. To every tribe, to every tongue, to every people. This is the most cosmopolitan movement ever. And they say with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. We saw this fear God means give reverence to God. It means give respect to God. It means living for him in our families. It means saying, Lord, whatever I eat, whatever I drink, whatever I do, is going to be all to your glory. It's, 
It's a people who realize that they're living in the judgment hour. And this message, flying in the midst of heaven, represents a church. It is a church. It's a movement which calls men and women that they're accountable to God for their actions. In an age of irresponsibility, God is calling for a moral responsibility. He's calling for obedience. God's final message for mankind declares the hour of his judgment has come. This is a people who recognize that this is a special time in earth's history. We are living in a time of earth's history as never before. No one else before ever has been in such an urgent time. No more business as usual. No more pleasure as usual. You don't go to a picnic on the beach when a tsunami's on its way. Right? No more business as usual. This is the message that God is sending, calling a people to be ready. The message continues. It says, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. It's a call to worship the creator. The Sabbath is a part of God's last day message. It's a call to come apart every Sabbath, to come out of the week every seventh day to worship God. This is God's urgent end time message. And dear friends, this message is going to the corners of this earth. We saw this morning, God is even sending special messages to lead people to the truth. And I don't believe any one of you are here out of accident. God's church must tell the world this warning. This is the second angel's message, Revelation 14, verse 8. It says, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This system is fallen, the Bible says, and there would be a, a church to preach that message to call God's people out of Babylon. Wine represents false doctrine. Babylon symbolizes a system of religious confusion. God is calling us to come out of confusion into his truth. This is that urgent plea. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Christ is saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Jesus is earnestly saying to his people in every religious denomination, come out of her, come out of the error, out of the, the false doctrine, into my truth. God is not only calling us to come out of something, but he's calling us to come into something. In his last days, there would be a movement it would be his movement, a worldwide communion that is keeping God's commandments. It's Bible-based. It's Sabbath-keeping. It's an Adventist movement. It's meaning it's a movement waiting for Jesus to come again. Don't cling to the teachings that are incompatible with the, with the Christ of Scripture. The first angel's message is a call to accept Jesus totally, completely, fully as your Savior and Lord. Amen? The second angel's message is a call to come out of the religious confusion of so many churches. These are the most urgent messages in the Bible. A large part of the religious community can't explain these messages. They'll tell you, oh, you don't need to understand them. The reason why is because they don't understand them. God is calling us to understand his truth. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's God's last day message. But when you come to the third angel's message, you find the most urgent appeal in all of Scripture. It is God's last pleading with humanity. Here it is, Revelation 9, 14, 9 and 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a, what kind of voice? A loud voice. 
This message must be heard. And Jesus is saying to his church, if you have an ear to hear, hear, dear friends. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Here is a message about the mark of the beast. It's a final conflict over false worship and true worship. This is the mark of human tradition, human authority. Or are we going to choose Christ's authority? Are we going to take the, the man's authority that has taken God's commandments place? Or are we going to cling to the truth because we want the truth? Because God offers the truth. This is Christ pleading, saying, Babylon has fallen, come out of her. The third angel's message regarding the mark of the beast calls all men and women to stand by their commitment to follow Christ. God says, I appeal to you, come out of her to accept my last day message of revelation. God's true church will meet these identifying characteristics that we find in Revelation 12 and 14. Number one, it will recapture the pure faith of the disciples. It will be the gospel that was preached in the New Testament times. It will not be an amalgamated gospel. It will not be a part gospel. It will be the full, everlasting gospel. Doesn't your heart long for the truth of God's word? This is more than denominationalism. This is recapturing the truths that have been lost sight of. Number two, they would have the, the, the two characteristics. One, they would keep God's commandments. They would be guided by the gift of prophecy. As we saw this morning, the seventh day on his church qualifies on both accounts. It would be a worldwide, mission-driven movement, gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has established work in more countries than any Protestant denomination. The largest international Protestant mission movement in the world. 202 countries. That is incredible. God has blessed His last day movement. God's true church will call people to total commitment to Christ. It will lead people to the Bible Sabbath to worship the Creator. It will encourage people to give their bodies to Him, to give up those things that are harmful, to do all things to the glory of God. And it would make a final appeal to accept the truth. Dear friends, I am a Seventh-day Adventist not because I'm employed by a denomination. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I have honestly studied the Bible. I have looked at the facts of Scripture. I have compared Scripture with Scripture. And I want to be part of a church that is Bible-based. I want to be a part of a church that teaches that salvation is not by works, but by grace. I want to be a part of a church that teaches, like Jesus did, that the commandments are still important. And that if we love Him, we're just going to simply follow Him. That if we love him, we're going to keep his Sabbath and worship him. I want to be a part of a movement that can look at the Bible, that can look at the book of Revelation honestly, that can weigh the evidence honestly and not have to dodge this text or dodge that text. I want a Bible, I want a Bible believing people that say, this is the truth and I want it no matter the cost. I'm not interested in denominationalism. I don't care about the glit and glamour. I'm not interested in what man teaches. I only want what God teaches. My heart longs for the truth of God. That's why I preach this message. Because my heart longs for truth. And I long for you to have the, the teaching of the Bible. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Because I want to be a part of a movement, part of a church that is dedicated and faithful to the whole counsel of God. Now I know that God's church is not the majority. 
I know that. But you can never base truth on a majority vote. Think this through. The majority were inside or outside of the ark. On the outside. The majority shouted, crucify him. Right? That's the majority. Now, if the majority were to go by the scriptures, I want it. One thing I do like that when I read my Bible, know what I realize? There's a whole heavenly kingdom that stands for the truth. And if I think of it that way, I'll always be in the majority. <laughs> Amen. How many, how many angels did Lucifer deceive? One third. That means that Jesus still has two thirds. So if you think of it that way, you'll always be in the majority. But when it comes to this, the kingdom of this world, the majority is not right. Jesus said, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Now, God's church may not be the most popular. Truth rarely wins a popularity contest. Some of you have had to stand for truth. And you know that it is difficult. It can be tough to take a stand for the truth. God's church is not the most spectacular. It doesn't have the most beautiful buildings in the world. But God values truth more than he values architecture. God values you. He wants you to be his church. Amen? Truth does not need the approval of popular religious leaders. Amen? If I have taught you anything in this seminar, I pray that it's this. If it's in the Bible, you want it. If it's not in the Bible, when it comes to doctrine, to choosing how to follow Jesus, you don't want it. Amen? Truth is truth, whether religious leaders accept it as truth or not. Every time in a series of meetings like this, people, they come to the meet meetings. The Spirit of God is moving upon their hearts, and they discover new truths from the Bible. They're, they're just moved by the Holy Spirit because it's His Spirit that is impressing their hearts. But then they get a little troubled, and they go to the religious leaders, and they ask them about the truths they're learning. They say, what about this? What about that? This is the warning, dear friends. The real issue is not what some religious leader thinks. The real issue is what is in God's Word. What does Jesus say? You come to me and ask me this question or that question. What matters is if I can prove it to you from the Bible. If I'm going to give you my opinion, go somewhere else. The question is, in God's final judgment, the question is not what did your pastor tell you, what did your priest tell you, it's what did Jesus say. The Holy Spirit leads honest-hearted seekers to his unchangeable eternal truth. When he does, truth, number one, beckons us to follow it. Truth burns in our souls. Have you been feeling the burning of the Spirit of God in your heart as you've been hearing these messages? I pray you have. I have been praying that you have. Truth frees our mind from error. There is a battle there. I know it. But it frees our mind from error. And it calls us to take a stand upon the truth. God is calling us to take a stand on his truth. James Russell Lowell, he writes about the triumph of truth in these words. It's a beautiful song in him. The tune that goes along with this song we, we sang this morning. 
but it says truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But that scaffold sways the future, and beyond the dim unknown standeth God watching over his own. This is the truth. Are you a truth seeker? If you want the word of God, God is going to bring it to you. If you're an honest, hearted seeker of truth, you're going to find it and you're going to hold fast to it. You're not going to let truth come into your life and let it slip away. You're going to hold it tight. You're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to hold that truth no matter what. Many of you have been coming to these meetings that prophetic curtain has, has been pulled open. I know because I've, I've been talking to you. You said, I've never heard these things before. There's been a struggle. There have been those things that you've previously understood. And then there are the truths and the light of God's words. I know there's a struggle. You're convicted on the word of truth that you found, and you sense the Holy Spirit leading you. And my prayer is that you, would, that you would want to say more than anything that, Jesus, I'm ready to give up the battle. I'm ready to open my heart to you fully and walk in your truth. Say, Jesus, I'm going to take that step with you. I'm going to take that walk with you, and I'm never going to part from your truth not easy to take that stand. I know it's not easy to take that stand. There was a Protestant minister. He was celebrating communion one Sunday morning. After communion, this woman, she stands up and she says, Pastor, would you preach a sermon next week about the text in the New Testament that says clearly that Christ changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? pastor said, no problem. I'll preach on it next week. The congregation that goes out, go out satisfied, the pastor heads to a study. He studies all week. He can't find the text. He goes to the pulpit and he says, folks, give me one more. Just give me another week. I've been busy this week, you know, and I need a little bit more time. He goes back to the scriptures. He studies the next week. He still can't find it. He's wrestling. He comes across some literature and he begins to study the true Bible Sabbath. You have to understand this. He had been preaching for 40 years on Sunday. He was a man in his early 70s. His whole life had been one thing. He said that the longest walk he ever took was the next week from his study to the pulpit. He comes to the pulpit and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot find the text that says the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Praise the Lord that he was honest enough to say that. He said, I only find, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And he said, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm a pastor, but I have to keep the Bible Sabbath. I have to find a people that keeps the Bible Sabbath. He says, truth, it beckons you to follow it. And I must follow the new truths that I've learned. It wasn't easy for him. Do you know he lost his job? He lost his home. He lost his retirement. He lost his car. But what he did not lose He did not lose the truth as it is in Jesus. Dear friends, when truth beckons you to follow it, why not make your decision to hold it fast? When God calls us, go all the way with Him. The Bible says, Revelation 14, about this special people. I'm going to read it to you in the Scriptures. If you have your Bible, turn with me. Revelation chapter 14. Notice what the Bible says. It says here in verse 4, it says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Are you one of those? We're going to sing a special song together. 
going to hear it play. We're going to sing a verse of this. I want to invite the pianist. I want to invite our uh, trumpet up. Let's listen to the Spirit of God. Friends, I've never heard someone say, I wish I would have waited to make my decision for Christ. But nearly every time someone says, oh, I wish I would have known how to follow him so much sooner. We're going to look at, listen to the song, The Savior is Waiting. We're going to play it through, and then maybe we'll sing a stanza of that together. Just keep playing. Don't you want to take that step with Jesus? God is calling us to take that step with Him. He says if we receive Him, all of our darkness will end. Within your heart, he'll abide. Let's sing this together. Time after time, he has waited before. And now he is waiting again. To see if you're willing to open the door oh how he wants to come in let's stand together let's sing this chorus one more time time after time time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. I'm going to let the piano keep playing. Dear friends, God is coming soon. This word is being preached because Jesus wants us to, to know Him. Through this series, we have, we began this series by saying it's a revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. And I want to finish this series by saying again, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a call for us to walk with Him. 
Yes, there's so much in there of warning, so much in there of, t of difficult things to come upon the world. But most of all, it's about Jesus being lifted up before us. And the Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 32, it says, If Jesus is lifted up, he will draw. And I know that, that Christ has been speaking to your hearts. I want to invite you. Our last night of the series. Take a, to take a special stand for Jesus. Many of you, you've made a decision already to keep the Bible Sabbath. Many of you, you have made a commitment. Said, Jesus, I know that I need to be baptized. Many of you have said, yes, I need to come out of the errors that I have known before and come into the marvelous light. If you've made that decision, I just want to ask that you come forward. Just come out of your seat. Just come right on down here. Take your stand with Jesus. Come forward. Amen. Come take your stand. Others of you may say, Jesus, I've made a decision to be baptized. But there have been things that I've struggled with. But tonight I'm making that commitment. I'm renewing that commitment. I just want to ask that you come forward. And I have a special prayer for you. Come take your stand. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Are there are others that want to take their stand for Christ. The Lord is calling you. It's not easy. It's not easy to take that stand. I praise the Lord for each one of you. Amen. God bless you. We praise God. Heaven says, the Bible says heaven rejoices. Amen. I have a special prayer for you. There may be others that say, Lord, I've been blessed by this seminar. I've learned new truths that I didn't know before. Maybe you've already been baptized. Maybe you've already committed to keeping the Sabbath. You said, Lord, this has been a blessing to me. I want you to come and join us. Come into the aisles. Come around here. Press close. Just come. Come as you are. I want to pray. Some of you may say, I still have decisions to make. I'm still weighing these things out. But I see that God is speaking to my heart. I just want you to step out and come. I want to sing this stanza one more time. And then I want to have a prayer. Let's sing this together. You may need to turn around to see the screen. Time after time, he has waited before. And now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Oh, Father in heaven. How you want to come into our hearts. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for what he's done in our lives. The truth is, is that not one of us would be here if it were not for Jesus. None of us would be here unless it was for his Holy Spirit reaching out and pulling us close. So Father, we want to thank you. We want to praise your name. But Lord, I want to have a special prayer for those who came forward. You've been speaking to their hearts. They know that it has been your voice. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Secure these decisions that they've made. The decision tonight has not come all at once, it's been that one step after another as they have been responding to your call. I want to thank you. 
please bless them for it. Seal that decision. May heaven record this night that they are taking that stand for Jesus. They're making a commitment. And they're going to follow him all the way. Lord, others, they are weighing these things. They've made commitments. They've made decisions. Tonight they want to say, Lord Jesus, please keep leading me. Keep helping me to trust your word. For everyone that has come, Lord, you promised. It was your word. We read it the very first night that if we read, if we studied, if we kept the words of this book, that we would be blessed. And Lord, I pray that we have recognized that blessing. So thank you for this time together. As we conclude tonight, may we know that Jesus is coming and we want to be watching. We want to be ready for that day. We pray this all now in Jesus' name. For his sake, amen. Amen. Thank you, dear friends. For those of you who came up right at the very first, if you can just hold by. I just want to talk to you just for a moment. If others of you want to come and, and join that, you want to talk with me afterwards, I'll be happy to have a handout for you as you go. A reminder, our Unlocking Daniel class has started this morning. Pastor Steve did an amazing job opening up that book. We're going to be here Wednesday night, 7 p.m. If you want to get signed up for that class, we want you to come and be a part of that. But I'd like to just hold your welcome to go. God bless you. Good night. I'm going to hold a few here just briefly, but others of you, you may have questions. If you want to hold by, I'll give you as much time as you need Tonight, I don't have to go home and prepare another sermon. <laughs> you got me as long as you need. God bless you. Good night.